Hello and welcome to Rethinking Assessment. This session comes to you on day two of Teaching in Unprecedented Times, a Fall 2020 Showcase. This January 12th to 14th Showcase is brought to you by Harvard's Office of the Vice Provost for Advanced in Learning in partnership with teaching and learning centers across the university. A few housekeeping notes before we begin. All sessions will be recorded, captioned, and posted to our website in the coming weeks. All participants will stay muted for the duration of the event. And initially, we're going to ask that you use chat only to contact us about tech connection issues. You will be able to ask questions. And to do so, use the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom window. You can submit your questions there, and you can view and upvote questions from other participants. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. This event is titled Rethinking Assessment, What 2020 Has Taught Us About Assessment. The rapid transition to online teaching has led to a number of innovations in teaching, but far fewer in assessment, yet assessment is a central part of instruction. In this panel discussion, we'll showcase novel approaches to assessment from across the university, and then during the Q&A, you will have the opportunity to rethink assessment yourself and help enhance learning in your courses. Our moderator is Eric Mazur, the Balkansky Professor of Physics and Applied Physics and Director of the SEAS Learning Incubator the John A. Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. He's joined by Molly Brady, an assistant professor of law at Harvard Law School, where she teaches property, land use, and local government law. Molly received the 2020 HLS Student Government Teaching Award. Pinar Don is le lecturer in public policy at Harvard Kennedy School of Government. She's an economist and is the course head for the required microeconomics course in the MPP program. Pinar also teaches an elective on game theory and strategic decisions. And we're joined by Andrew Ho, the Charles William Elliott Professor of Education at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. He's a psychometrician who works to improve the design, analysis, and use of educational tests. Without further ado, let's begin rethinking assessments. Eric, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Jonathan. And uh, let me actually start by pointing out the Q&A button at the, at the bottom. I, I, I suggest that everybody clicks on the Q&A button right now to have that open. This uh, permits people to put in questions and upvote each other's questions so that I can make sure that I ask our, our distinguished panelists the, the most burning uh, questions. So thanks again for the introduction. Uh, Jonathan, it's really a pleasure to talk about assessment, an issue that I've only started to think about way too late, uh, almost like, a, like an afterthought. I remember that initially when I started teaching at Harvard, which is now almost four decades ago, my whole focus and energy was how do I teach? And it's only much later that I realized that assessment in the eyes of the students is the tail that wags the dog. And I spent a good part of my, uh, my career at Harvard improving teaching in the classroom, making it more interactive, making sure that students were actually learning, that it was not just teaching that was going on. Uh, you know, that gave rise to interactive large lectures. And then I think about 10 years or so ago, I realized I can do all I want change my, my approach to teaching, what matters to the students is really assessment. And as long as I don't change assessment, I'm not going to be able to affect the way uh, they learn. In fact, I gave a talk uh, a number of years ago here at Harvard called Assessment Design Killer of Learning. I won't, won't, won't say much about that, but it was meant to be provocative that often it's the assessment that uh, either stimulates or does not stimulate the students to learn. And of course, the whole problem about assessment has become even bigger this year as we moved online. And I wanna just, just present one little idea that has been an absolute game changer for me uh, this year as we went online. It was clear that it would be much harder to do assessment online than it is in person. And over the summer, as I, I started thinking about my uh, course this fall, I came across a number of articles on something called specifications grading. And uh, specification grading essentially is a pointless system. You, rather than 
taking the different parts of a course, the different assessment, whether they're assignments, problem sets, tutorials, whatever, midterm exams, final exam, papers, uh, presentations, you name it, rather than giving a grade for each of those and then sort of averaging them at the end to come to a grade, you divide the course into units. My course has an unbelievable 60, that is six zero units, each of which is completely pass, fail. So it's either pass or fail, but you clearly delineate what the specifications are that a student needs to uh, meet in order to, to pass, if you want, that uh, specific unit. And then at the end of the course, the grade is determined by not how well or poorly you've done on all individual units, no, on how many, for how many units you've actually met specifications. On top of that, students can redo, if you have not met the specifications, you can try again and resubmit work to prove that you can actually meet specifications. So what are the benefits? One is it's been a complete change in the attitudes of students with a much bigger focus on learning. There's been absolutely no grade grubbing because it's either pass or fail. And often it's very hard to argue, you know, when you don't meet the specifications if they're clearly uh, stated. It's much less stress for the students because they have much more autonomy in determining where they put energy. And even if they don't pass a certain unit, they can try it again. And it's small enough to be low stakes. And finally, as teaching staff, we were able to focus much more on providing feedback. Assessment is an interplay between feedback and ranking. And unfortunately, grades put an undue emphasis on the ranking and students tend to ignore the feedback, which is crucial to learning. So I highly recommend anyone to Google specifications grading. There are a couple of uh, articles that appeared in Inside Higher Ed and uh, the Chronicle 10 years ago that will put you on the right track that, um, that will actually provide you a lot of information that you can use to see if you might consider uh, specifications grading. Anyway, enough for, for the, the, the contribution that I wanted to make to this. We, we have three phenomenal panelists. I've asked each of the panelists to uh, you know, give six minutes of remarks, and then we'll launch into the Q&A. Please put your questions during the presentations in the Q&A. Upvote each other's questions, and, uh, and uh, we'll have a conversation. Pinar, why don't we start with, uh, start with you? Thank you so much. I actually want to start with thanking the organizers for this series of events. Um, I've been finding them very, very useful, and I also would like to thank them for including me in this session on assessment. Um, I also take um, this opportunity quickly to thank to um, Harvard Kennedy School leadership, because um, I think we were very fortunate to have our leadership to prioritize the online learning, and we have been provided with lots of um, resources this summer to to, to prepare. In particular, we had an excellent workshop um, organized um, by Slate and led by our faculty member, Teddy Suornos, and we had Kate Hamilton, May Klinger. Um, it was just, it was just itself was an example of effective online teaching. And most of the changes, if not all, we have done this semester really was inspired by that workshop. So I would like to talk about um, the course uh, 101, API 101, which is the markets and market failure. Um, this is a microeconomics course. It's a required course for um, the MPP, uh, Master of Public Policy students. And we have more than 200 incoming students every year. So this course is taught in multiple sections by multiple faculty. So the other faculty were Janina Matusetsky, Marcela Alshan, and um, we also have uh, Chris Abel teaching is a differentiated section which is more advanced. Um, I'm the course head of the course and I was teaching two sections um, this, uh, this in this fall which was pretty challenging but we had also a great team and I just want to acknowledge that very quickly. Um, so first of all I have absolutely no experience in teaching online. Um, I'm excluding this half a semester thing happened after spring. Um, but I know we have lots of colleagues who are experienced in online um, teaching. There are lots of successful online courses. 
And um, so for me, it wasn't really about transforming the course for, uh, to sort of make it, you know, to teach it effectively online. So that wasn't a real question for me. For me, the question was um, how to transform a course to teach it online, whereby we had to teach online because of a pandemic because that makes a big difference. So when we talk about, you know, we're navigating through uncharted territories, it almost sounds poetic, but it's really the pandemic and, you know, people are dying, people lost their jobs and not all of our students feel financially secure. Uh, they don't feel safe. So the question is more so for me was how to teach during a pandemic. So we've made lots of changes in this course, um, and I won't talk about those changes, but most of these changes were really transforming the course from in-person teaching to online uh, teaching. But the piece on assessment, which is the topic of the panel today, really the guiding principle was to keep in mind, it's impossible to forget that we are in the midst of a pandemic. It's an uncertain period of time, people are stressed. So how do we rethink the assessment um, strategy? Now, traditionally in this course, we used to have two big exams, midterm and final exams. I think it's typical for most of the quantitative courses, relatively easy to grade, practical, but less than ideal uh, during the pandemic. So instead we adopted a, a, an assessment strategy whereby we assess students learning on a continuous basis with lots of differentiated um, requirements and, and these were all lower stake requirements. So we had you know, pre-class questions, we had weekly um, post-class questions or problems. We had end of unit assessments, reflection questions that students had to answer during um, the live class sessions. And I think most importantly, the component which had the largest weight uh, on students' grade, and I know as Eric said, we shouldn't be focused on so much on grading, more so on feedback, but since students do stress about grades, this component um, involved, like we, we gave students an a set of options to choose from. So we call this pick your own um, assignment strategy. And um, for example, students could write them retrospective, applying some of the course material on their past professional experience. And they could deliver this with a paper or a video. So they were given this option. I think it gave students some sense of agency during a time of uncertainty. So very quickly, I wasn't so sure about that piece on pick your own assessment, to be sure, because I thought, you know, microeconomics, we have to test them with an exam. Um, and I didn't know if we could learn about their learning through this type of um, assignment, uh, but I'm very happy to see that um, it is possible. And actually, I think we learn more than what we learn in typical exams. Very quickly, because I have one more minute. Um, what were the advantages of this assessment strategy? Well, we also embedded some flexibility into the system, given the number of um, requirements the students knew from the outset that we would drop the lowest grade uh, within each um, requirement so that to relieve that pressure, the huge advantage was the reduced stress. Uh, and that was very conducive to learning, obviously. And um, we were giving constant feedback to students, which was great for them, but we were also getting feedback. Oh, we didn't teach this really well, maybe we should revisit. So that sort of feedback was so helpful to adjust the course as we moved on. Um, and I just want to actually, because I received my course evaluations very recently, I want to read, of course I did cherry pick, but it was, you know, it was actually looks like an excellent year. This year, I want to just quote from a student uh, which really talks about this assessment strategy. So I appreciated learning from all of the various opportunities, pre-class exercises in class reflections, post-class problems and end of unit assessments. I learned the material far better with this structure of periodic non-cumulative assessments. I truly learned the information rather than trying to cram everything into my brain for massive exams. I was able to receive timely feedback and grow in my approach, understanding early on in this course, rather than waiting for big tests or projects. It's absolutely incredible to end the course with a reflection on real world question in economics. So I did pick one quote, but there are many as such. It was, um, I think this was the best, this was a good idea. We didn't know uh, Exante. I would recommend everyone to 
rethink the assessment strategy and start assessing students much early on rather than, rather than waiting for the midterm or, or whatever the typical time for these assessments happen. Um, and one last thing, minus, minus one second. If you are going to ever um, adopt a similar strategy, we learned that two things are crucial. One is communicating the idea of the strategy. Why we're doing this, which is not similar to um, some other courses. So explaining that um, it's, it's crucial. And then second is to establish a routine. There are many different requirements. You don't want to overwhelm students. These have to happen with a certain routine and students need to have a great canvas page as we do, which is designed by Ashley Davis, to have, the, have access to um, required pieces very easily. Um, I think that this is all for now. Thank you very much. Uh, Pinar, I, I just have a, actually a couple of quick follow-up questions I, I, I want to ask now rather than waiting until uh, later. <laughs> Um, one is, you know, in going from, you know, traditional system with, you know, one or two midterms and an exam to this continuing assessment, have you found that it's a, it's a much more, it's, it's a bigger workload for the teaching staff? And if so, <laughs> is it sustainable? Okay, so I sort of wanted to avoid that part. <laughs> it was a lot of work. I, 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 I think we were lucky that we had a great team. We had resources to help us um, with development of these different pieces. Um, I think I think it's it's a lot of work. It is sustainable. It is possible. One needs to have a reliable, large uh, teaching team because you know this feedback has to be given to students on a constant basis, and all these pieces have to be developed and just not randomly. They have to complement each other in certain ways. So, in short. It's much more work, definitely. Um, actually, crazy amount of work, but I think it is worth it. I can't imagine doing it differently. If I had to do it again, um, I would do the same regardless of like the cost of it. And and actually, we are thinking to adopt some of these aspects as we go back to um, um, in-person teaching. Okay, that, that was actually my, my next question. Will you continue to do it even if we're not online? But, but uh, that, that, that's, that's a very important point. Thank you, uh, Pinar. So let's turn to uh, Molly. Great, thank you so much, uh, Eric, for corralling us. Uh, and thank you to VPAL for organizing this. Uh, it's wonderful to talk um, about assessment uh, here today. Um, and I also should, uh, say thank you and uh, give a shout out to the law school where I teach because uh, Dean John Manning and our Deputy Dean Glenn Cohen have worked really hard on getting the law school up to speed. In fact, at this very moment, I am missing a catch up uh, with survey data from students and faculty about what worked and what we can improve on uh, that I look forward to hearing, uh, hearing from my colleagues about very shortly. Um, in any event, I wanted to talk uh, or uh, talk about a couple challenges that we face specifically at the law school and then how I responded through a assessment strategy. And I want to mention two specific things. So let me start with the challenges. So uh, the law school culture is a challenge. So uh, we are a school that always has had one cumulative final, not even any midterms along the way. Uh, and that has even prior to the pandemic led to effects on students. First, uh, they're upset that they have limited forms of feedback prior to uh, their grade. And also it's, I think, reduced our capacity as faculty members to be able to speak to our students' abilities because we're sort of stuck reviewing a final Final often read in a three hour span in order to uh, get a sense of what they can do and what they're interested in. And so I've always uh, not enjoyed that. Um, the second thing that I think of as a challenge, uh, which I know is common to most of the schools, is that we are 100% remote at the law school and our students are geographically dispersed across the globe. Um, and so that was another uh, challenge, not being able to sort of have a commonality of thinking about law uh, in Massachusetts or in the United States even uh, from one spot. I should also mention one limitation here, because uh, I see there have been uh, some questions about it already. Um, I cannot speak to uh, any sort of, uh, uh, how should I say, innovation in grading, because at the law school, we are on a really strict and mandatory grading curve. So we just have less flexibility as a school um, in that regard. So to respond to these two challenges, kind of the 
challenge of the cumulative final and then also being 100% remote, uh, there were two things that uh, I changed about assessment strategy or started doing more of. Uh, and one was taking advantage of geographic distribution of our students in developing formative assessments. So the classes that I teach are property, land use, and local government. There are uh, about 80 people at the law school, all Juris Doctor students uh, for the most part. And so I've developed a bunch of different formative assessments where they can take what they're learning in the classroom and apply it to something wherever they are. So a really simple one uh, that I've used is find something in the local newspaper of wherever you are that relates to what we're talking about in class and write a two page reflection, either testing the concepts uh, or, or thinking about how the theories we are learning uh, apply in that context. And it really helps me get to know the students. They get some practice writing. And if I notice things are going off the rails or sideways, I can kind of course correct or say this concept's a little different or one of my TFs can do that. Um, I've also done a few other things. Uh, so I've had them look up the zoning map for the place where they are. Uh, so this being the city zoning in order to understand how land use law works. And then they get a picture of kind of how law has shaped the community that they're in. I've had them pull the deed uh, or go do a land record search for uh, the place where they are currently living and find out what's the name of the person that owns this building. Again, using public records you can get on the internet, but letting them kind of apply what we're learning in class to where they are currently. Um, I also have uh, had them in local government think about the local government structure of either the place where they are or the place where they are from. Uh, I've had them as well uh, either call in on Zoom to local government meetings, which are actually easier to get to right now than uh, perhaps ever before, or else watch the footage uh, afterward and think about what the concepts that we're learning in class have to do, how they appear or don't appear um, in these real life settings in places where, um, where they are. I will also say I've uh, long used discussion threads, pre-class written assignments um, in an effort to sort of stimulate student discussion and get them to engage with one another. I have found that to be obviously great uh, online, but also it's given me, generated for me, some hypotheticals uh, and other things that we can talk about in class that I think make them feel more connected. So we were talking about nuisance law in property and a bunch of my California students brought up something called the Flintstone House, which was a woman who put a bunch of giant dinosaurs in her front lawn. Uh, and so as a class, I was totally unaware of this and I brought it into the class and then those those students felt like, oh, even though we're far away, we're seen um, and we can talk about something that's kind of happening in our backyards. So I think thinking creatively about ways to bring in where students are or take advantage of geographic distribution through formative assessments, that's been a really successful strategy. The other thing I wanted to mention uh, just briefly is uh, how I have made sort of qualitative uses of polling software, because I think often when we think of polling, we think of sort of clear answers you know, being able to choose A or D, and then that gives feedback to the instructor uh, that they can tell what the class is understanding uh, or not. In law, there are often right answers, but a lot of the time you can argue a point. Um, and so we've had to think kind of creatively about how to use polling. So just two uh, uses that I have found successful that I, I consider forms of assessment, even though we're not grading the students on their uh, poll responses. One is we, of course, teach through the case method. So we teach them about you know, different cases and the majority opinions and the dissents. Um, we have used polling, I think, really successfully at the law school to get a picture both before and after our discussion about what the students think. And that can be helpful, too, in generating uh, class discussion and questions because a student who might think, oh, my opinion is the minority, sees that actually 50% of their classmates have the same opinion or think this was rightly decided or wrongly decided. And so that, I think, has been really successful. And we usually do it pre and post so we can see how people move, if at all, which is really fun. Uh, the other type of polling software, I use Poll Everywhere, but the other uh, feature, I guess, of uh, polling software that I've used is a word cloud uh, while we've been remote. So we, we've often in class done uh, close readings of passages and generated a word cloud of what we think are the most important things in a given statute or case. And then we can kind of pick out what uh, from there is biggest or really small, and I can kind of get a sense of what they're perceiving uh, as uh, important. Likewise, the reasons for a particular rule. So if everybody sort of sees you know, this reason for a rule as being a really good one, maybe efficiency or fairness comes up really big uh, and we can kind of get into what the class is uh, thinking. So I just wanted to mention those two things as sort of more qualitative uh, uses of polling uh, software. I think I'll stop there.
Thank you. Thank you, Molly. And I, I love that you managed to uh, <clears throat> bring in the student's environment in, 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 into your course. And I, and I think many of us are discovering that having sort of a globally distributed student body has advantages that, uh, that are just phenomenal. Um, I, I, I have fairs in my, my class at the end of each project, and I used to bring in audience, a local audience of judges uh, during these fairs. And then we went online in the spring last year. I was still in this mindset, oh, I got to get judges from MIT. And, and, and then it, it, it took about a month for me to realize it doesn't matter where they're geographically located. I can have them from everywhere. Have you thought about um, how you would translate this back when everybody comes back in person? Yeah, so some of the stuff that's been sort of geographically about where they currently are, I think could easily be, you know, for us teaching professional students, where did you go to undergrad? Or where did you grow up? Or where's the, where's the last place you lived? Uh, which I think, again, will just have, will make it real and also bring in a diversity um, of experiences. So, so I think that, and I will say also, you know, with respect to sort of judges or guests, I hope that we'll somehow be able to continue to have the fabulous guests uh, and speakers and especially surprises. I think the students have really enjoyed that when somebody surprisingly jumps you know, into class, of course, not a surprise to me, but, uh, but someone that I'm invited that they're not expecting to talk about a concept, you know, the lawyer that argued a case or something like that. So I think the guest feature from everywhere is one of the best things. Yes. Yeah, I'm wondering how that's going to work out if we have some people in person and some people, you know, on video. I, 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 I can now visualize having my entire class on, on the screen. I know from many years of teaching what it is to be all together in the same classroom, but splitting it up I'm, it still makes me feel very, uh, very uncomfortable. Um, Andrew, why don't uh, you take the floor? Sure, and, and um, as the others have said, uh, th thank you so much for for putting this on. Um, I I am a psychometrician, and I do work with assessment, and I could just couldn't agree more that it's sort of this hidden cornerstone uh, of of teaching and learning that we overlook all too often. I, I often say, you know, to folks, if if I want to know what it is that you teach, I don't actually want to see your syllabus. I want to see your final. I wanna see your collection of assignments. I wanna see what folks actually do in your class. And so I think it's so important to be able to talk about this um, uh, explicitly. And also I think, you know, as, as we've been talking, just to highlight the trade-offs that we know from, from assessment and just make them explicit, right? And like I've, I've just sketched out three based on, on what, what we've been talking about so far. First, between the flexible and the comparable. We want assessments to be flexible, especially now in these crazy times, but the more flexible you make them, the less comparable they can be. And that threatens potential fairness if there are high stakes grading. Two, we want things to be authentic and we want them to be feasible, right? <laughs> authentic, but that's hard. Like in, in an authentic assessment, we want lots of assessments at multiple times that are as real world as we can, but that's really, really challenging and it's taxing on the teaching team and there are all sorts of hurdles, right? So authentic and feasible is also a trade-off. Uh, and third, and maybe I'll talk maybe explicitly about this, but the collaborative and the selective, right? And by which, by which I mean in the real world, we want to work in teams. We always work in teams, uh, but we also need assessments to be selective. And when we say select, we don't mean selecting teams. We mean selecting individuals. So there's a lot that I already see comments in the Q&A uh, that I'm sure we're going to talk about um, momentarily. And so um, those kinds of tensions, again, the flexible and the comparable, the authentic and the feasible, the collaborative and the selective, these are always trade-offs in assessment. And we just have to make our purposes of assessment crystal clear in everything we do and be intentional about it, because there's almost no way to, to beat these trade-offs. They are just sort of built into our systems. Uh, so I'm going to spend the next you know, five minutes or so talking about um, the pitch I have for you. And the pitch um, is called the, the Conversational Celebration of Learning, uh, which my students affectionately call the CCL, the Conversational Celebration of Learning. Um, so I'm stealing uh, this term from Justin Reich, who has rebranded tests as celebrations of learning, which I really like. This is the conversational celebration of learning, which is AKA an oral exam. And my pitch to you uh, is to try an oral exam, try a conversational celebration of learning in your class, and especially now. Um, and the reason is because conversations are so rare. 
conversations about content are so rare and hard to do these days. And if you put on a conversational celebration of learning, you will find that your students will have conversations with each other about content, which I think is authentic, collaborative, and an explicit learning objective of my course and many of your courses. So to give you a little bit of context, because how is this feasible, you'll ask. And so this is, to be fair, a, a doctoral course where grades are not, I, I teach a psychometrics course in the fall. It's a doctoral course, so the grades are less important. They just sort of want to learn this stuff because they're going to go out into academia and do it. So, so they're not so concerned about the grade. They're just like, no, no, I really actually need to know this. And there's only 20 students, right? And so that we can talk about feasibility later. Um, but that's important context. And then, so uh, I think you'll see across our different um, applications, we have, have different constraints. Um, but um, uh, the students are from the GSE, HKS, SPH, GSB, uh, all over the place. So it's a short oral exam. It's like 20 minutes of structured content. Um, and so I have to do it over multiple days, even, even for just 20 students. Um, and so um, we also know that from assessment theory, we should make this low stakes, like not zero stakes, but low stakes. Why? Because it turns out that you can only, you know, ask a couple of questions in 20 minutes and people answer different questions well or poorly, and there may be all sorts of hidden biases. So I don't recommend anything more than 10 or 15% of the grade uh, as a weight. But again, the most important thing is that it encourages students to think and study in a new way, not just like writing down answers and thinking about it among themselves in their heads, uh, and, and consulting books and going back and forth. But no, 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 have an authentic conversation back and forth with folks because, hey, it turns out that's what we do. You're going to go to seminars and ask questions and be asked questions on the fly. We're not going to be able to consult textbooks. And you're going to have to know, like, curve, you have to anticipate curveballs. And so we have students, you know, that as they prepare for this, the conversational celebration of learning, the CCL, actually interacting with each other in this way, asking questions of each other, pushing and prodding at their understanding, right? If I, and, you know, just to give you an example, like, you know, if, if R squared is 0.9, what does 0.9 mean? If reliability is 0.9, what does 0.9 mean, right? And so, and, and why is it important? Why is R squared important? Why is reliability important? Why is any of this important, right? So these are the kinds of conversations that I, I hope to encourage you all to have with each other. Obviously this time uh, we held it over Zoom. I've done it in the past um, uh, uh, in my office. Um, but again, I think it's more important this year than any year because conversations are so rare. How do we make it feasible? We can potentially scale it to teaching fellows, right? And they can also be recorded on Zoom, which is convenient in a way that um, we might not have been done, uh, been able to do in person. Um, so I, I just want to leave it there at this point. Just again, the takeaways I hope are, are the trade-offs that we always face um, when we do assessments. And then to try to make conversations about content an explicit learning objective that you can incentivize with a conversational celebration of learning that inspires folks to have conversations about content which again, in this, in this d disconnected time uh, are so rare and I think so valuable. So with that, I'll pass it back to uh, uh, Eric and everybody. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Um, I, I love your, uh, your focus on conversations and it reminds me of something that I wanna mention in just a second uh, that I came across at the end of the semester, unfortunately, otherwise I would have implemented it way earlier. But first I wanna come back to something you said in the beginning, you, you briefly talked about the purpose of assessment. And I, I wanna bounce the question back at you. What is the purpose of assessment? Why do we, why do we assess students? Yeah, so for, for me, it's ultimately about learning, right? Um, uh, number one, um, it's not about sorting and selection and signaling, right? Those are important goals and they have their place. But for me as an instructor, again, in a particular context, right? I teach in a graduate school of education. Right? I teach mostly doctoral students and many master students for whom mastery is the goal. Right? They actually need to know how to use these statistical methods in research in three months, and they want to know how to do it. Right? So I don't have to create artificial incentives and, and, and signaling to them. They, they know that they're going to enter the real world and do this stuff in three months, six months, three years, six years. Um, and that enables me to sort of lower the stakes on grading, grading only as a, uh, to inspire teaching and learning, uh, and then maximize like, look, you just need to know how to do this. That's my job, that's our job, let's work together to get you there. I think different schools, I'd love to hear Molly talk about this, I'd love to hear you talk about this, Finarta, and, and the people in the audience, you are, some of you are faced with explicit directives from on high 
because you are a sorting and selection machine the way that I and my students in GSE are not. So we don't always have control over that. Um, but I'm with the fortune of that flexibility, I can put a stake in the ground and say, my goal uh, is to get you to learn and assessments are directed um, it, to, toward that purpose in a single-minded fashion. But, so let me let me then ask. Yeah, go ahead, Pinar. Sorry, ahead. Um, I, I really love this idea about this, you know the con cele conversational celebration. I think you know I, I don't think it's feasible at our scale, but I I want to learn a little bit about the feedback process in this kind of conversation. So how does it really happen? Do you instantly give them feedback, or do you take notes and then um, how, how does it work exactly? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So um, I so it's 20 minutes, but I block 30 minutes. And what I do is I, I actually, and this, this time it was very easy for me to have a teaching fellow sit in. Um, and my teaching fellow took notes uh, and I took notes uh, on the conversation. So 20 minutes um, uh, in, a, in Zoom with the waiting room function enabled so people didn't barge in. Um, and we'd go 20 minutes. Um, and then the next 10 minutes, we just I just frantically typed. There was like boilerplate, because this was structured, right? I wasn't just asking random things. Um, it was structured, it was drawn from previous assignments assignments, but then with these little offshoots and tangents where I thought it was appropriate and I could scaffold on the fly, which is really important, right? Um, but, uh, but then the, so the next 10 minutes, I would just write them a quick one paragraph email. Um, uh, that was that was that was about the feedback, what they did well, plus deltas, right? What they did well, what they could improve, um, a grade on this, you know, standard grading scale, um, and send. So immediate or close to immediate, 10 minutes. So, so uh, in um in December, I think it was a little bit too late for me to implement in the course, although I started implementing it um, over the break. I read in, um, of all places, Wired Magazine, a very innovative idea of essentially having the students <clears throat> uh, prepare short videos and send them in. So it's a conversation. It's not really a conversation in the sense of going back and forth, but they orally explain and record themselves. Uh, I'll put the link to this article in, uh, in, in, in the chat. I found it a very interesting idea. I've implemented it with a few students who needed to make up a couple of the units in order to satisfy meeting specifications on enough units to pass the course. And, um, I have say I was very impressed by the result because as you said, Andrew, it's actually much easier to judge people uh, when, when you hear them, you know, verbally explain their understanding than, than if you do it by having them, uh, them solve, uh, solve problems. So I'll put that link in the- If I may add, actually, this is exactly one of the options we had on our pick your own assignment strategy. And 24 of our students did choose to convey their stories, their retrospectives in the form of a video, uh, which was very interesting. And um, one, one issue has to do with, again, this is Andrew's earlier point about having, um, okay, there were lots of trade-offs he mentioned, but the one on uh, flexibility and comparability, I think it becomes a little bit more difficult when you have these different formats of, you know, some people are have great skills of video production and it's hard to not be impressed about that or great you know communication skills so i think it becomes grading becomes much more difficult but it was a joy to watch how they apply these concepts and conveyed it in a video format so before we get to curving and grades on the curve, there are two questions, one from Lisa Sievert and the other from uh, Maria Flanagan. But before we get to that, I wanna come back to um, our discussion of the purpose of assessment. And, you know, I think, yeah, of course you need to assess. And you mentioned the focus should be on the learning and the assessment can actually be a learning opportunity, although the way it's usually used, it's not a learning, uh, uh, opportunity. It is more a sorting and, and filtering type of uh, opportunity. But here's the, the, the maybe somewhat controversial question that I want to ask uh, to all of you. Um, are grades necessary for learning? Right? I mean, you can assess people without attaching a numerical grade to it. I'll let Molly so are grades necessary for learning? 
I certainly don't think they're necessary for learning. Yes, although I do think that um, yeah, as a, as a, as a school on a strict maybe maybe one of the only ones on a strict uh, strict curve, I think. Uh, you know, whether it's also, I think we're very normal within law schools. There's only one law school I'm aware of that has moved away from the curve out of the hundreds, um, which is kind of amazing, which does suggest that there is a, perhaps a different professional function. But as far as assessing learning, you know, I can say one thing, which is that um, many of the assessments that I give are credit, no credit. Um, and so students just automatically get five points if they turn in the assignment. And I have never really noticed anyone slacking off uh, in all my years of teaching, even though they all get the credit regardless of what they do instead. Um, and I think that's something else that can nicely be, you know, uh, uh, a hybrid um, is that if there's sort of uh, challenges in comparability, I could imagine actually just leaving this conversation, maybe thinking of different ways students could fulfill those five points and giving them some choice um, in that while also testing the same or assessing the same uh, type of subject matter knowledge. So certainly I don't think a grade is necessary uh, for learning. And even though we do give final grades at the end of the law school, and that probably isn't going away anytime soon, I think having credit, no credit uh, uh, assignments is one thing that you can do even within a fairly fixed model. You know. May I say, as you know, as typically economists will say, it depends. Um, I think it depends on the type of the course. Um, I'm currently learning something. I, I won't tell you what I'm learning online, but I'm not graded, and I'm just so much learning and enjoying that learning because I chose to learn that thing. Now, so these are electives, right? And we have um, core courses, required courses. Um, you know, we have wonderful set of students coming to Canada School who wants to do, wants to learn and change the world, but they don't think microeconomics is necessary to do that, right? So not all of them are equally motivated. And unfortunately, some do get incentivized by some grading scheme. They want to see some reward, almost like, okay, this is the amount of time I'm putting in this. And I want to see some measure that comes out of it because maybe I'm not convinced that this is extremely useful. So I think in some courses, having grading can motivate a set of students. I would say, I think. But but here's the question. Will it motivate them to actually learn the way we want them to learn? Or will it motivate them to do whatever is necessary to get the grade that they need to grit? And I think we may think naively that those two things are the same, but I, I would argue, and I think there's lots of data that 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 shows that, that that is often not the case. I see, I see Andrew get a smile from one ear to the other. This is, you know, this is my wheelhouse, right? I'm trying to let other people, <laughs> I, don't want, I don't want to give lecture five of assessment theory. <laughs> but you know, my colleague Dan Kortz, it's like Campbell's law, right? You make an indicator a target, it's no longer a good indicator. It's a classic. Uh, I, I would say, you know, for, so my answer is no, uh, uh, although I concede Pierre's point, right? Ass assessment is not necessary for, for learning. Feedback you is. Mean, you mean grading, grading is not necessary. Right? Yes, I think gr grading. Assessment, I mean, you can't give feedback. I mean, there's a question from, uh, from Cassie in, in the, the Q&A, um, um, is there a time where you wouldn't recommend assessing? I think you cannot give feedback without assessment, right? Exactly. I mean, I, and, and I think we need to distinguish these three concepts, assessing, which is an evaluation, uh, feedback, which gives feedback to the learner on, on what is good and what could be improved, and then grading, which I think is some sort of a, a very simple one dimensional unfortunately metric that tries to 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 get to come to some sort of ranking yep and and you know like the argument would be so to pinar's point i mean so there's a certification aspect to it. And certification doesn't necessarily have to serve the student, it could serve society, right? Um, there are you know, mechanics tests and doctor, you know, the medical tests, like the, these could arguably not serve the, a learning purpose, um, but larger societal purposes. So to, to her point, I think it depends. My joke is always, what's the hardest, most authentic multidimensional test that Harvard students ever face? Life. No, I, well, I, that that too. I was gonna say. So the the, the joke is, it's it's admission, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> right? So once they're in, right? What what else do we have to do? Right? So anyway, um, we should probably open it up, Eric. But uh, but yes, I, absolutely, uh, we could talk about this over happy hour uh, and many many other hours.
Absolutely. Yeah, let's me point out to to everyone here that that most of the panelists can uh, can hang around past five. We'll have sort of a, a free for all happy hour. We'll promote everybody to uh, to the to the stage. Uh, and but but you know there's been this question from Maria, and I think we're we're now at the right point that we can actually tackle that that question, uh, which says what are the panelists' attitude uh, attitudes to use of curves, you know, like in in light of you know specifications grading that seem to have some sort of an absolute standard rather than the curve. So, what are people's feelings about curving? Me play maybe play devil's advocate because even though I don't think uh, that's sort of right the role of the lawyer on the panel anyway, but um, but uh, you know I'm no huge fan of curves, but um, I did go to a law school that was not curved, and given the sort of limitations of uh, the number of prestigious jobs, et cetera, uh, what ended up happening was sort of cults of personality um, around professors. So we sort of had this sort of you know like if you got to know the right person or were slotted into the right class or won the waiting list, you know, I think that um, that that was sort of a, a downside of not having a metric to compare by or um, or what have you. But as I said, I don't think I want to defend that uh, too strongly. You know, that was probably the total loss of comparability and probably some abdication of people's uh, responsibility to grade fairly, regardless of whether there was a curve or not. Um, but uh, but I do think, you know, given what we know about uh, learning that I'm, I'm no defender of them. Pinar or Andrew? Well, I just I just want to say that I mean I, we we have a dean's recommended distribution that we have to apply, you know, more or less with some flexibility. But I think the problem with with the curve is um, you know students come to these schools, I think to law school, Kennedy School, you know, with with great academic backgrounds and they're sort of these students with straight A grades, okay, grades don't matter, but you know, these are, and, and then, you know, it, it takes so much time to communicate and look, everybody is similar now. And now when you get a B plus, it's it's not a B plus, actually it is, it is something pretty good. And that is something very hard to communicate. And I think students do get frustrated um you know when when they see these grades and then when they are sorted you know and, and it's i think it creates a sort of um to me some, some sort of an unpleasant um in you know sentiment or or sometimes at least some unpleasant exchanges you know why did i get this and so on and so forth so i think um i wish we could really grade them in terms of like we had a different way to say, okay, this is this is you know this is A, this is A work, and this is A minus work, but that would be also for me very difficult to, um, I mean maybe because I don't have experience in that sort of grading, but I think that would be also something challenging to come up with that sort of scheme. So yeah, I, I don't basically I don't have an answer, but I do see that it's a source of stress for students seeing these Bs, B pluses, although they're not really bad grades. So. Let me say one other quick thing that uh, just goes actually to what Andrew was saying earlier about the target, which is that even though um, uh, my flexibility as an individual faculty member is affected by an existing curve, um, I try to widen the target. Um, so I make it about we are learning these skills. This is broader than just the grade you get in this class. I will be an advocate for you regardless of how you do if you work hard in this class and do your best. Um, and I think that that has also been modestly successful, even though they do get a grade at the end, they really do focus more on the skills building that they're getting through the assessments as opposed to just sort of like, what do I need to do to nail the final? Yeah, and then and then on the subject of grades, uh, let's not forget, I mean, some of our most successful alums are dropouts <laughs> and, and, and people, you know, I think, I think we need to realize that, that grades in the big scheme of things are extremely meaningless and, and that most employers would never hire any of our graduates based on, on a transcript. They have a conversational uh, assessment of, uh, of the people they want to, uh, they want to, uh, they want to hire. And, and, and given that grades and curves provide stress and given that stress is not conducive to learning, I, I, I really think that we're doing, 
learning a disservice. I'm still, you know, trying to find the balance between the right motivators. And 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 um, I think trying to find some sort of a shell, and, and I think the case study method does that in a certain sense, right? By by adding to most cases a component of, of, of empathy or social good to to sort of get students more intrinsically motivated. And, and I've tried to mimic that, even though I teach a physics course, try to mimic that by giving my the, the project in my course a component of empathy or social good. So, so rather than, than telling my the pre-meds and engineers to take my course, and we're only taking my course because somebody told them, you have to go and learn physics. Not They're not there because they want to learn physics. And rather than telling them, here's my book, learn it, it's good for you. I, I shove the content aside and try to come up with something that has a deeper meaning for them, a project that, that, that has a, an impact on potentially on society. And then once they're really enthusiastic about the project, that tell them, you may want to have a look at this book. It may help you with your project. So the content, rather than being a goal in its own right, becomes a goal, you know, a, a means to accomplish a goal that's more meaningful in the minds of the of the students. And then to some degree, the grade destroys that because it replaces the intrinsic motivation with a with an extrinsic one. So there's a very interesting question uh, that that I, I would like to address in the in the final eight minutes. And again, um, most of us are are going to be hanging around. So if you want to have a more informal conversation uh, after five o'clock, then uh, please hang around, and we'll we'll turn this into a regular uh, Zoom meeting. But there, there's one one question that I think none of us has addressed yet, which would be good to discuss, namely the use of peer evaluation, you know, and, and, and I'm of the, I think this is a really important question because ultimately what is important in learning is, is what people in education call metacognition, the ability to reflect on your own learning, which means evaluating your own learning, but that starts with being able to put your learning in the context of that, of your peers. So I, 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 I'm a huge proponent of, peer evaluation, but I would love to hear what the three of you have done that involves uh, peer assessment. I mean, I'll just quickly say, I think I think you're one of the foremost um, experts on this, not just from like what you've published, but from your, your own experience. So you, should, you might want to talk more about it. I, I, I will say that we um, have a, a pretty wonderful history um, and uh, set up around our, our teaching fellows, which is a form of peer assessment. Obviously, they are um, there sort of a year or two above the students that they're um, that they're evaluating. But I, I think that that's an incredibly valuable experience for them uh, to again change their perspective from one of uh, learning to one of teaching. And you know, it's the whole like you know, watch one, do one, teach one, you know, s s sequence that, that, that everyone should be able to, to go through. I think the challenge with peer assessment most commonly is that folks, uh, you know, uh, who haven't learned it have real challenges, um, both providing, um, both evaluating and providing feedback. And of course, you, you know that well. Um, but I think the most important goal is co collaboration broadly, right? And peer assessment can be one of the, one of the steps towards that um, and that's where I fear to, to connect this back to a previous thread as well. That's where I fear and have the most philosophical objection to the straight curve, to the strict where yes, twenty percent must have. I don't, I don't, I don't mind if an A is an A and means a certain thing. The criterion referencing we talk about in testing, I do have a problem with if only a certain percentage can achieve it, uh, because that then creates an everybody for themselves mentality that obviously threatens my own learning objectives uh, uh, around uh, collaboration. Um, and and team teamwork, um, uh, but uh, but I think that there is certainly promise in peer assessment, and and they, you should point them to some of your work on that, Eric. Yeah, I, I put in a chat an approach which is not my work, which <clears throat> but I've used it with great success in a number of my courses, which is something called calibrated peer review, where you you calibrate the students' uh, peer assessment using uh, using model pieces. Uh, uh, unfortunately, that just went commercial, so now you have to pay for it. And I don't think that Harvard has a has an account, but it's it's well worth uh, looking into. But Pinar Molly, any any thoughts on on peer assessment uh, from your schools? 
I've not used it in the big uh, lecture course. You know, I do little group problems and things like that. But certainly in seminars and when my whenever my students are writing papers, um, I usually have at least two students provide feedback. Um, and I don't grade. I, it's sort of again, I use the credit no credit model. So uh, for sort of presuming that a good faith effort will be given, but uh, so I don't grade either the feedback or you know how much the individual student responds to the feedback and I don't sort of you know let the one student tell the, uh, what grade they would give the first student instead it's just a way of sort of you know uh, both giving them the experience of editing which is another learning skill of course involved in writing papers uh, and then also uh, uh, giving them a bunch of different comments so two students plus mine or a TFs on any given thing which can also just show the range of, uh, of possibilities and inevitably improves the final product. I mean, I don't know if it exactly counts as a peer assessment, but I briefly tried it in uh, my elective course where I have group projects. And in group projects, as they're actually studying game theory, they know this issue of free writing <laughs> and all these dynamics. And then, so there was this um, time that I tried to have students give me feedback about each other's work, you know, how much they have contributed and to what aspects of it. I, I, I tried it once and it's just I didn't feel comfortable with that process somehow. I, I think maybe I, I should have done some research doing it perhaps properly, but um, I don't know even that if that counts sort of a peer assessment, but at least they were giving some feedback to me about the process through which they um, produced that end product and what the contributions were. Um, but besides that, I don't have any experience. So would love to hear if um, among the attendees, if, if there are people who've tried it. So the happy hour or after party is happening uh, once this formally ends, is it for half an hour we stay around to chat? That's great. So we're, we're, we're three minutes away from that. So, so in closing, one minute, each of you, uh, because uh, Susan Khan is asking a question about plagiarism and originality, I, and I know this is a huge subject, but it, it, to some degree it comes back to intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. So with some of the schemes that you've implemented in your course, to what extent has there been a problem? Plagiarism or have cheating? You tried, have you tried burying your head in the sand? I hear that works well. It's just you know the ostrich technique. If you don't look, it's not happening. Um, now I, I say that uh, I, I say that with full attention to how serious this problem is. I worry that it changes me into a sort of a different kind of teacher where I'm always you know looking for the gotchas and becoming incredibly paternalistic. But at the same time, I recognize it's a real problem, and we create incentives for it. Um, I think their incentives are worse when the um, when the standards are too high, the tests are too narrow, they don't feel authentic. So I think there's there, there's a responsibility we have to take on our end as well. Uh, but it's a real problem and there are numbers of solutions and businesses in place to try to prevent it. We can talk more in happy hour about it. Molly, Pinar, any thought, closing thoughts? About plagiarism or in general? <laughs> about, about plagiarism cheating on yeah. exams or on assessments. Yeah, I mean, I... I... I, I thought that the way in which we assess students learning this semester where, you know, these end of unit assessments were open book, they could look at their notes, they would take it during the course of 24 hours. Um, you know, they do sign an honor code, but I, I didn't feel like, you know, given also how they've done in these different pieces, I don't think there was a major issue of cheating. And also when you give students assignments where they have to reflect on their own professional experience, in applying these course concepts, it's hard to, it's hard to, you know, copy from somebody else's experience. And I, I would like to believe that it wasn't a major issue, um, but yeah, it's it's a good question. Well, we are on the top of the hour. Uh, a lot of ground that we covered, and there is still so much more to cover on assessment. But I'm so happy that we did the opportunity to talk about the tail that wags the dog for our students. So thank you all. Thank you, uh, Pinar, Molly, and Andrew, and all of you in the, uh, in the audience. Uh, Molly, unfortunately, has a meeting to go to, but uh, Pinar and I will stay, and I will uh, happily have everybody promoted to 
uh, to the stage so we have, can have a regular Zoom meeting and you can either raise your hand or unmute your microphone. So thank you so much again. We'll reconvene for the happy hour in 30 seconds. I'll be chiming on in voice of the voice of the office of VPAL here, just to thank everybody for joining us today, even if you can't stick around for the after party, which we certainly hope you'll do. If you can, we do hope you'll join us tomorrow for the final day of this week's showcase, which tomorrow at 11.15, we have a creating a culture of feedback in the online classroom, which will relate very much to this topic. And of course, we do recommend the dozens of videos newly recorded by Harvard instructors in our Teaching Innovations Gallery. For details and all of these, go to vpal.harvard.edu slash vpal-events. Good night, everyone. We look forward to seeing you soon and preferably meeting you at the after party now.